Y'all can be seated. I hope y'all had a great break, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm going to take one second. You're going to notice a change in the back row tomorrow. Okay, we're going to shorten those glass down so it doesn't go as high as it is right now. I can't take it all the way down, but I, how should I say, cheat it as much as I could to get them down so that it gives you a little bit more noise coming up. Okay? So don't be shocked tomorrow that you see a line like in front of you. Okay? With that, Ms. Swanson, ready to continue? Yes, Your Honor. You may proceed. All right, and I'm going to, we ended on this page with the last one, Mr. Dressbach, of April 3rd, 2017 at 230227, two milligrams of hydromorphine override. So let's keep going on the next page, please, sir. What is the question, Your Honor? I'm asking him to read the next page. Okay, I thought you were asking him to explain the line. Can you explain the next line, please, sir? At 2302, Nurse Tyler Springer, under the patient of Ryan Hayes, removed one vial of two milligram uh, hydromorphone via override. The next line? 2302, Tyler Springer, under the patient of Ryan Hayes, removed one vial of two milligram uh, midazolam via override. Next line? Your Honor, I'm sorry. I I know this went on for a long time, but I, I think now at this point he's just reading the document which speaks for itself. If there's certain things within it, the prosecutor would like to explain, no objection to that. But just reading it? I can certainly ask some additional questions. Okay. How many more medazolims were drawn via override in this page, Your Honor, sir? One, two, three, four, five. Looks like okay. five more vials. All via override? Yeah, I'll be override. All right, I'm going to just move it up a little bit so you can get the last line. How many more vials of fentanyl were drawn via override? It appears three. So three more. Okay, all via override also? Yes, it appears all via override. All right, and let's look at the last page. How many more vials of fentanyl? Four, all via override. And what times were those vials of fentanyl pulled? Those all four appear to have been pulled at 2305. All right, now I'm going to go back just briefly. So this is what you said your order consisted of, these 10 vials. Ten vials, correct. These ten vials were, you did not see. Correct. All right. So that okay. would have... Hold on. Just for the record, there are ten of the... Initially, there were ten up, and then they added the additional... I can't count from here. Ten, Your Honor. Ten more vials that were previously introduced uh, for demonstrative purposes. Okay. So that would make it record because they yes, don't know. Yes, Your Honor, I apologize. Thank you very much. All right. So going back to State's Exhibit 2C, regarding what patient, sir? Ryan Hayes. All right. I'm going to talk about this last order on this page. Okay. What time and date was it placed? Uh, this bottom order was placed at 2315 on April 3rd, 2017. All right. For how much fentanyl? Uh, 1,000 micrograms. And just going down to the pharmacist, that's not you? The pharmacist, no, that is not me. Doctor placed it? Dr. Husel. All right. So that would be those other 10 vials of fentanyl? Yes. Okay, hold on. Yep. Tech issue. They can have all this wonderful technology, but the batteries are still the same problem. So, how are we doing there, Madam Court Reporter? You, is, is it working? 
Oh, you don't have it in your ear? No. Okay. Okay. You may continue now. All right, Mr. Dressbach. You retrospectively verified these 10 vials of fentanyl, plus the five of hydromorphine and five of midazolam. Correct. Why didn't you bring that to anybody's attention at that time in April of 17? Because I, if I remember correctly, this was the first time I had encountered the 1,000 microgram dose, and my initial thought was that someone had accidentally put a zero in too many, so instead of 100, it said 1,000. And I had called and spoke to, I don't know if it was the nurse that put the order in or, or removed it, but just asked them to change the order because my assumption was they had put too many zeros in. And they said, no, that that was the correct amount, that they had already pulled and given that medication because they were working on the patient in the room. And okay. then I just verified that indeed, like Dr. Hussle was aware that that was the amount that was pulled and given, and they said yes. Were you advised it was for a palliative withdrawal at that time? No, not at that time. If you had been, would that have concerned you? It would have been concerning, yes. Now, come Rebecca Walls, the order was for 10 bottles, 10 vials of fentanyl, 1,000 micrograms. Correct. Plus the, I want to say, hydro, am I correct, midazolam? Yes. You did move that up the chain. Tell us what led to that decision. Well, again, after the incident that um, happened in October, uh, we were advised to watch for those and escalate them up the chain if we encountered them. And so clearly here was an instance that I, I didn't know what it was being used for, so I rejected the order until I could find out. Then the order gets administered and completed, and then if you go into the chart, I could see a note in there that the, there was a plan for a palliative extubation at this point, but it wasn't necessarily documented if it had happened yet or not. Um, so that's when my assumption was that's what it was used for. Um, ultimately, even beyond that, I was concerned about the fact that people were overriding at one time such high doses, and then on top of it, one person was removing them and another person was apparently giving them. Now you're talking, you've talked a few times about this October incident. Tell us what that, what you know about that. So it was in late October. Um, I was working with the other pharmacist who was Talon at the time. Okay. And, and Talon, he, Talon, what's his last name? Shoyer. Okay, go Shoyer. ahead. Um, he received a phone call. I, I have no idea about what time it was, but um, I wasn't on the phone call. I could just hear his end of the conversation. And he sounded like concerned and was asking some clarifying questions about doses and all. Anyhow, when he hung up, he had said that okay, they had your pulled. Honor, what he said. Okay. What was your understanding of the situation at that time? That a large number of narcotic vials had been removed from Pixis and administered to a patient, and there appeared to be no corresponding order. Okay. And did, from that, was that where the order came or the instructions came for you to move any other type of orders up the chain of command? Yes. And that's why you did that along with your concerns? Yes. Was that the, was this, and I'm getting, gonna show you States Exhibit 20A, email November 19th, 2018. Was that the last email you had sent out with concerns about this? No, it was not. What happened next? Um, on November 21st, I became aware that sometime on, I, I believe November 20th, on an evening shift, there had been a palliative extubation in the ICU, and again, they had withdrawn a large number of fentanyl vials out for that palliative extubation. All right, now you indicated you became aware. How did you become aware of this? I received a phone call from a nurse uh, in the ICU that they couldn't obtain fentanyl from the Pixis machine that they were nearest. So I advised them to go to the other machine until I could find a technician that was free to refill the machine. And they said, no, both machines are out. They have done, they did a pallet of extra. Your, your Honor, it's not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted, only to show what he did next. I'll permit it for that purpose. Ladies and gentlemen, you're only to consider as to why he did something. As to the statement, whether it's true or not, 
you can't consider that here. Okay? Okay, so go on, just finish what they were telling you and what you did next. She okay, advised me. Let's, let's, I'm sorry. You walk right back to where we were a minute ago. Let's okay. re-ask the question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you told them to get, you told the nurse to go get the rest of it, get it from the other Pixis machine, and they said they couldn't. What was the rest of that conversation? That both machines were now depleted because they had been used on a patient earlier in the evening. Okay. What did you do from there, sir? So, from there, I had suspected, I knew who the patient might be because I had a, a pneumatic tube that came down. Okay. Uh, that's how we deliver drugs throughout the hospital. Okay. That was full of medications for this patient, and the patient was expired. So I just asked, was it this particular patient? And they said yes. Objection, Your Honor. Hearsay. Again, just being offered to show what he did next, Your Honor. For that purpose, it will be admitted. Okay. They said yes. What happened next? So I went into that patient's profile to see what was ordered and what had been administered, and that's when I found that I believe it was 2,000 mics of fentanyl, and I'm, I'm not sure how much Versed may have been on it, had been pulled and administered to that patient. So 2,000 mics, again, would be 20 vials of fentanyl? Yes, of those vials, yes. So again, we have 20 vials up here. All right, and what was this patient's name, sir? Um, the last name was Penix. I don't recall the first name. Melissa Penix sound familiar? Melissa Penix does sound familiar. Okay. What did you do from there? Uh, from there, I gathered the same information I had gathered um, two nights before on the Rebecca Walls. So the nurse involved, times meds were pulled, uh, times meds were administered, and I essentially copied my previous email and amended what information needed to be amended. So no longer referred to Rebecca Walls, but were referred to Melissa Penix, and then sent that email to Randy. All right. And I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification as State's Exhibit 20B. Can you please identify that for us, Mr. Dresbach? This is the second email referring to Melissa Penix. And what date did you send that on, sir? November 21st, 2018. And again, this would be the one regarding Melissa Penix and the information you had gathered? Yes. What concerns you about this incident? Well, now we have an issue where, in this instance, the medications were removed. Um, well, you can see here. The medications were removed from the Pixis 15 minutes before orders were even entered. So someone was removing that kind of quantity of fentanyl and Versed without even orders being present. So that was concerning because there's a, a large opportunity there for drug diversion. On top of that, now the dose was from 1,000. We're now at 2,000. Um, so I felt like just 48 hours ago I was in this exact same situation and now I'm in it again, and I'm still waiting for some sort of clarification or instruction from administration on what we should be doing. Uh, because obviously, the meds are freely available and being removed and administered. All right. And when you looked into this, these meds were removed via override also? Um, I believe so. Well, if, if they were removed 15 minutes before orders were even put in, they would have to be. Okay. There's no other way to remove meds. And you indicate that in your email? Um, let's see. I don't know that I use the word override anywhere. I'm going to direct your attention to about halfway through that paragraph, sir. Uh, where you talk about removed from Pixis. Okay. Well, you're, you're compounding a question oh. there. These meds, I'm sorry. There it is. I missed it. These meds. Um, we're removed from Pixis via the override function at 22.28 and 22.30 for the fentanyl. So again, you send this to Randall Miles, one yes. of the supervisors, Dr. Miles? <coughs> yes. And he at least appears, looks like he passed it up the chain of command. Um, 
from here, I don't know if he passed it up. It looks like he sent it to our clinical coordinator, okay. Sarah. All right. Um, 20B, true and accurate copy of that email? Yes. Kept in the normal course of your business? Yes. Mr. Dresbach, at any time were you placed on administrative leave during this process? I was. Tell us about that. I was placed on administrative leave, I believe it was March 13th, 2019, <coughs> and I was on administrative leave until November 13th, 2019. Were you provided any reason for that? Uh, just that. Your Honor. Sorry. Sorry, I'm trying to do two things at one time. Uh, he knows why were you terminated? Do you know why you were terminated? You weren't terminated. I wasn't terminated. Administrative. Amended. Not a specific reason, no. And you were ultimately brought back? Yes. <coughs> did you ever have to talk to a pharmacy board investigator? I did. Did anything happen with that? As far as my license? Correct. No. So you've maintained your employment and no issues with your licensure? Correct. I have no further questions. Thank you, Mr. Dresser. Ms. Manashi? Can you yes, please. Do you those up there for you? Uh, yes, please. Mm -hmm. And they're in order, I believe. Okay. Mr. Dresbach, okay. Diane Menashe on behalf of Dr. Hussle, showing the witness what's been marked as Exhibit 11, page 83, Exhibit 11, page 279, Exhibit 11, 569, and Exhibit, that's it, Mr. Kerr. You were asked a lot of questions on direct about any doctors that ever prescribed as much fentanyl. Remember that? Yes. Okay. And you work in the pharmacy? I do. And would you agree with me that orders for medication placed in the OR never come down to the pharmacy? I would agree. So you have no idea what medications are or are not being ordered with respect to fentanyl in the OR, for example. That is correct. Showing the witness what's been marked as Exhibit 11, page 279. Mr. Dresbach, does this appear to be an order of medication for patient James Timmons? Yes, it does. If you could, I'm directing your attention to ordering physician. Are you familiar with that phys physician name? I am not. You would agree with me that that's not Dr. Husel. That is not Dr. Husel. Okay, I want to go to the order details. Could you tell the jury what is being ordered there? Yes, so the medication is fentanyl, and it looks like 2,494 micrograms. I'm sorry. Uh, it's 14,321.2494 micrograms, right? Okay, um, it's hard to see the decimal point on mine, but yes, if that's an entire comma, then three digits, and a decimal point, then yes, okay. 14,321.2494 micrograms. Because I sat here this morning and looked at all these vials. We were asked about all the vials. I'm not even sure, Mr. Dresbach. If we could fit, if these carry 100 micrograms? 100 micrograms. So let's take 14,000 micrograms of fentanyl that was ordered by a doctor other than Dr. Husel, right? Correct. How many vials would we need up here? Uh, 140. 140 vials. And those vials were ordered for patient 
James Timmons. That is correct. Could you tell the jurors the date when that was ordered? Um, that was ordered on 10-23-2018 at 11-44. Night shift? No. I'm sorry, day shift? Day shift, yes. Day shift, 14,000. And please go to the discharge date of Mr. Timmons. Uh, just the date? Just the discharge date? Sure. October 24th, 2018. And assuming that this patient uh, died, that would be the date of death. Would you agree with me on that? I would agree with you on that. So the day before that patient died, he received from another doctor more than 14,000 micrograms of fentanyl. That is what that would indicate, yes. One of the things when you're reviewing orders to determine their appropriateness is tolerance, is it not? It is. So let's talk about James Timmons. Uh, your exhibits, Paula? They're right up there. Thank you. Showing a witness that's been marked as State's Exhibit 11C, we know that James received 14,000 micrograms of fentanyl the day before he died from a different doctor, right? Correct. Okay. And you were asked, you weren't asked about that on direct, is that right? That's correct. But you were asked about this order of fentanyl right here. Um, do you recall this? Yes. Okay. And this order is on 1022. Would you agree with me on that? That's when the order was placed, yes. Yeah, for, for the, for, and how many, tell the jurors how many uh, micrograms that's for. 100. Okay, then let's, and, and the doctor ordering that? Dr. Husel. So just 100 micrograms. Just 100 micrograms. And you were asked about this word discontinue. Correct. Isn't it true, though, Mr. Dreisbach, that when someone dies, medications are marked as discontinued? Yes. So let's go to the second page of State's Exhibit 11C. When you were asked about, actually, before we do, just want to make sure. The date on the 11, or the 100 micrograms is 10-22-2018? Yes. And the date of uh, death or discharge is? Yes, 10 So two days later. Two days later. Now that second page, that 2,000 microgram that you were asked about, right? Yes. Tell the jurors, what date is that order? Order date is October 23rd, 2018. And the time? Uh, 0008, so eight minutes after midnight. So eight minutes into the 23rd day of October, that is ordered, correct? Correct. And we know that his date of death is 24 hours later approximately. Correct. I also want to go back to this order, State's Exhibit 11C, again, ordering physician Dr. Husel, is a titration. Yes. So sometimes the order is calling for a push, and sometimes it's calling for a titration from Dr. Husel. This order would just be for titrations. So yes. it's an infusion. They can titrate the rate of that infusion. Um, right, the, no, which, which, which speaks right there in all caps. The, oh, sorry, this is my copy. Speaks here in, in all caps. It says titration dose. Would you agree with me on that? Yes. Okay. And that was for the 2,000 that you were questioned about on your direct examination. Correct. And it appears that patient lived for a whole other day. 
Correct. You were asked a lot of questions about State's Exhibit 26A and 26AA. <coughs> Do you remember those questions? Yes. And remember, as part of that line of questioning, you talked about uh, the intra-database at Mount Carmel and that it's easy to use. You can navigate and look at a lot of different resources. Yes. One of those resources is Lexicon. Correct. And you'd agree that there is no maximum dose for fentanyl in Lexicon with respect to palliative extubation, correct? I did not recall seeing palliative extubation listed under fentanyl as a, as a disease state in Lexicom. But there's no maximum dose to fentanyl in Lexicom. There's not. There's not. Showing the witness what's previously been marked, or what is being marked, is Defendant's Exhibit MCP1, MCP2, and MCP3. Because you still work at Mount Carmel. Yes. And in your capacity as a pharmacist for 20 plus years, uh, you're familiar with policies and procedures with respect to medications, correct? Correct. Showing you what has been marked is MCP, Defendant's Exhibit MCP1. I'm going to go to the page 5 of 5. Um, if you could, Mr. Dresbach, just the date that this appears to have been um, the, the date that it appears here is what year? Uh, 2012. Okay. Does this look familiar to you? Mount Carmel policy and procedure? Yes. It does? It does. I want to take you to paragraph 22, though. Isn't it true that despite you being asked a number of minutes question about, about these two documents right here in IV guidelines, that in Mount Carmel's own policy, it reads, sometimes particular patient conditions warrant giving medication outside of the IV guideline specifications, <coughs> i.e. <coughs> obesity, pain control, and tolerant patients, palliative care. Reads yes. that. So Mount Carmel's own policy and procedures say, sometimes, these don't matter. And one of those times is palliative care. Correct. Not just the 2012 guideline says that. Wouldn't you agree that, in fact, the updated version of that same policy and procedure, what date does appear to be on uh, this document? July 28, 2017. Does this, again, uh, just generally look familiar to you as to Mount Carmel policy and procedures with respect to medical administration and self-administration guidelines? It does look familiar. MCP2. This time, though, directing your attention, paragraph 23 again, but it's oriented in a different part of the guidelines. Same language, right, Mr. Dresbach? Sometimes pa particular patient conditions warrant giving medications outside of the IV guideline specifications, i.e. obesity, pain control, and tolerant patients, and palliative care. Right? Correct. And then it goes on to say that if the medication written is outside the IV guidelines, go to things like Lexicomp for guidance. Right? Yes. But you just testified and told the jury that Lexicomp doesn't include a maximum dosage with respect to palliative care. No, it does not have a maximum dosage. And then, showing the witness what's been marked is Mount Carmel Policy 3. Do you recognize, generally, again, Mount Carmel palliative care policy and procedure? Yes. 
palliative ventilator withdrawal. And that's what we're talking about in this case, right? Correct. All these cases. Directing your attention to number two. Appears to say, does it not? Symptom management medications will be ordered as medically indicated. It does. Doesn't say in compliance with IV guidelines. No. <clears throat> because palliative care is different. Is that a question? It is. Yes. You talked a lot about overrides. A lot of questions were asked about overrides. And as I was listening to them, it seemed as if the implication is, is that an override is hiding something. Right? Like the intent is to hide something if someone does an override. I don't feel that way. Okay. So why would someone do an override then? Give me the reasons why. Uh, they may do it because they they feel they need the medications right now and don't want to wait for a pharmacy to receive an order, review an order, and approve an order. And in an emergent situation like an ER or ICU, there might be a number of times when that happens, right? Correct. Patient over the weight that might suffer, make the patient suffer, right? Correct. Okay, and so it's no surprise to you, are you familiar uh, with the audit that was done on the number of overrides on the ICU floor? I am not. There was three machines, though, on the ICU floor, right? Three PICTUS machines? Correct. And um, overrides, then, based on your testimony, are, are for, like, emergency situations? Correct. When someone feels that, that there isn't time to wait, is that fair to say? When a patient's life is in danger for delay of therapy, yes. So that, showing the witness what's been marked as State's Exhibit 1B. Do you remember being asked questions about this with respect to uh, Joanne Belisari? Being asked what specifically? I'll go to it. This order of fentanyl right here that you were asked about on May 4th. Yes. Do you remember that? And, and tell the jurors again how much fentanyl that is. 200 micrograms. 200 micrograms. And you would agree with me based on the times that this appeared to be an override. That based on the times this appeared to be an override, it does appear to be an override. And so it really serves as a prime example. Let me withdraw. You said 200 is totally normal. It's a very reasonable dose, yeah. And it's an override. And it's an override. And the doctor is Dr. Husel. Correct. So the override has nothing to do with the order placed. It has to do with the situation at hand. Correct. talk to you now about Ryan Hayes. Just give me a second. Showing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 2C. Ryan Hayes is the uh, 
I'm just going to generally describe it, is the patient that during your direct examination, there was the 10 vials and the 10 vials, right? Correct. And you just testified that an override is for an emergency situation. Correct. Would you agree with me that an order sheet doesn't tell much of the whole story as to what's going on in the room? Absolutely, it does not. It's just, it tells you who typed something in, right? Yes. And, and the medication order. Correct. But a medical administration record, showing the witness what's been marked as ex Defense Exhibit 2, page 402, 403, and 404. A, a medical administration record, assuming you know through your experience working as a pharmacist, is a more detailed report that tells the story of when the medications are actually given. Yes, it's the administration record. We could go to the top. I just want to confirm this is for Ryan Hayes. It is. Okay. And this, again, is this case where you were shown those 10 vials and then shown those other 10 vials that you said you didn't know about. Correct. Right? You could look right here to the admin date with respect to the fentanyl. Could you, could you read um, the date and time of that to the jury? Yeah, so this item right here, the fentanyl, is on April 3rd, 2017 at 2257. And um, if we can cross compare, How many micrograms is that for? Uh, it is for 1,000. And referring you back to the order sheet for Ryan Hayes, fair to say that order for the initial 1,000 was put in as routine? Yes. And routine, you testified on your direct, is different from STAT and also different from ASAP. Correct. Routine withdrawal. So let's go back to this. So the first thousand was given at 4-3-22-57. Correct. Do you agree with me that the pain score is noted as 10? It is. And then 2257, it appears that what drug was administered? At 2257, hydromorphone. 10, 10 milligrams? 10 milligrams. Same time, what other medication is, uh, is given? Midazolam, 10 milligrams. So that 1,000 plus those other medications that you just named were all given, right, within basically the same time? That is what that would indicate. Yeah, and the record indicates pain scores 10. Correct. Let's go right down here to the next time you see fentanyl. Tell the jurors what's the date on that. The date down here is April 3rd, 2017. And the time? The time is 2312. How many minutes after the first thousand was given is that? Let's see, the first thousand was given at 2257, and then the next at 2312, so 15 minutes? 15 minutes. If you know in the course of, of being a pharmacist, or do you know that a nurse's obligation is to track pain every 15 minutes? Do you know that? It would depend on the, the patient, but yeah, in some patients they do track pain. I, I don't know. I guess I don't know specifically 15 minutes, no. Okay, but tracking pain is part of a nurse's job. Yes, they routinely have to track pain. So the pain score is 10, and the, the administration records show that 1,000 was given um, of fentanyl, correct? Uh, up here, yes. 2257? Yes. yes. 15 minutes later, the pain is reassessed. What is the medical administration records say as to the pain relieved with medication? It says no, right there. Patient got 1,000 plus those other meds and is still suffering, according to that record. According to that record. 
So then that takes me back to Ryan Hayes and the order that you were shown and those 10 extra vials you were questioned about. Because isn't it true that the second order of fentanyl for those 1,000, what does it say right here? Staff. Are you familiar with the bad death? The bad death? Mm -hmm. I've heard the term, but I can't say I'm exclusively familiar with it, no. What does it generally mean to you? Objection, Your Honor, the bond doesn't count. Okay, sustained. Let's rephrase. You're familiar with palliative extubations generally in that process, I would assume? Yes. And um, in that type of uh, extubation, things can go wrong? Yes. And we know that the administration record noted that a thousand grams or a thousand micrograms of fentanyl didn't alleviate the pain. According to that record, no, it did not. And and when you say according to that record, Mr. Dreadfall, that's all we have, right? Because we don't have video footage. Not that I'm aware of. Right, and we don't have. Uh, still photos of what's going on in these rooms, right? Not that I'm aware of. And, and, and records, while certainly aren't in an ICU setting, instantaneously input, it's as good as we've got. Correct. So you have nothing to refute that the pain wasn't relieved after a thousand micrograms of fentanyl. Correct. And then the next thousand is entered in as a stat. That is correct. So it's actually, and, and, and then you indicate on your duration. I believe that's what we displayed, yeah. 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 So now that you know more about the picture of what was happening in that room, the fact that you didn't know about those extra 10 vials makes a little more sense, doesn't it? Well, I wouldn't have known about those extra 10 vials regardless of all this unless I saw the order. Right. No, that's not my question. Right? The fact that it was an override and put as a stat was because it was emerging. I would assume I didn't write the prescription. questions about States Exhibit 24M and 24B. Just generally, these, these are reports from Pixis machines? Yeah, activity reports. And, and you seem to talk a lot about the Pixis machines on direct, so I'm assuming you know that every machine requires a fingerprint to access it? Yes. And that fingerprint, I, that keypad for the fingerprint, I think is next to the keyboard. Am I right about that? Yes. And also requires a passcode, does it not? It requires your associate ID. Okay. In addition to the, I put my print here. Yes. And that, and so if I were to give Dr. Husel hypothetically my associate ID, right, his fingerprint would not work. Correct. And absent having that fingerprint password and also the associate ID, you can't physically open that drawer and get those medications, correct? Right, you would not have access. And any time the drawer is accessed with the fingerprint and the associate ID, there is a record of it, correct? Correct. Which is what these are, right? Correct. So if I'm let's say, uh, Jason Sims, let's just say I'm Jason Sims for a day. I open the drawer, there's a record of it. There's even a time when I open the drawer. Yes. There's also, I'm showing you States Exhibit 24M. You were asked about 
a number of overrides um, with respect to what does this patient appear to be? Uh, this patient would be uh, Rebecca Walls, it appears. Okay. And um, I just want to, again, because we're so much talk about the frequency of overrides, on page one of State's Exhibit 24M, does it appear to be overrides there? There do appear to be a few, yes. And what about on uh, patient two of Rebecca Wall's uh, PIXIS report? Yes, there are overrides there. And just as an example of uh, where my finger is, what, what is 1359? I, I know that's military time, but in, in regular time, what is that? 1.59 p.m. in the afternoon. So that's day shift. That would be day shift. Okay, so overrides aren't, aren't exclusive to night shift. They are not. In advance of today, for purposes of preparing for your testimony, how many times have you met with the prosecutor? Twice. And uh, when, when were those dates? One was October of last year. I don't remember the specific date. And the other was February 7th. Yes, February 7th. And was your attorney there with you when you met with him? Yes. And um, you currently still work at Mount Carmel? I do. So you weren't one of the employees that was laid off? I was put on leave for eight months. Right, but you weren't terminated. I was not terminated. And wasn't your leave paid? Yes. <clears throat> so you met with the prosecutors twice. If you know, uh, were those recorded, those prep sessions? I honestly don't know. How long the first session last year that you met with the prosecutors, how long was that meeting? Two and a half hours, approximately. And how long was the meeting um, in February this month? Around two hours. And have there also been emails uh, that the prosecution has sent you, or do they send those to your attorney if you know? They send those to my attorney. And in those communications co and conversations, uh, they've let you know that while you've been subpoenaed and you're a state's witness, they don't intend to prosecute. I don't think I've ever received anything that stated that. That's certainly your understanding, is it not? I have not been granted immunity in any form that I know of. Okay. And so it's your testimony that you never received anything from your attorney that indicates that you won't be prosecuted if you, if you tell the truth? No. Okay. So let's talk about the other interviews you, you've given in addition to the prosecutors, the time of the prosecutors. You gave uh, an HR interview? Correct. And you gave an interview with Columbus Police Department? Correct. And any other interviews I'm forgetting about? Um, with the uh, investigators from the Board of Pharmacy. Ah, oh, right. Investigators of the Board of Pharmacy. So I want to talk about the HR interview. Because as I heard your testimony on direct, was that with respect to um, Ryan Hayes, you called down there, down, or I'm sorry, you called up. Up to the ICU. You called up to the ICU, and you testified today under oath that um, you called once and nobody answered? No, not for Ryan Hayes. For Ryan Hayes, I got an answer. I'm sorry, was it Walls? It was Walls. Forgive me. So Rebecca Walls, you called once, and what happened? No answer. And then you told this jury you called twice, I called the back number to the ICU, yes. What's the back number? The ICU is large, so it has a front section and a back section, and they had two different phone numbers. <clears throat> so there's actually multiple ways that if you want to get a hold of someone in the ICU, you can. Yes. At any given time, right? At any given time, yes. And you, assuming um, to refresh your recollection, for today's testimony, did the prosecutors ask you or did you review the notes from your human resources interview? I did not. Right. Do you remember then 
that actually uh, in your human resources interview, you talked about, you, you were asked about why in the medical record did you type into the medical record with respect to Rebecca Walls discussed with provider? I don't believe that was typed in. That is an option when you get an alert for a dose that's outside of range and you have to go past that and you have a few options to list. The default is discussed with provider. <coughs> Yes, there was an option on there that would say, discussed with provider. Why then, during your HR interview, would you be questioned about that not being true? They may not have seen any <clears throat> documentation that backed up the discussed with provider. Oh, so because there is a comment section, right? There is a comment section. And so if it's a box you had to check, and you knew checking that box was a lie, there was a comment okay. section, Your Honor. There Sustained. Was, okay. So there's a comment section. Comment. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, disregard the question, your question. In the comment section, in Rebecca Walls, you never put, I did not, that they checked the box. In, that, that's not true. Right? Could you repeat the question? Sure. You check your box, it says discuss with the writer. It's pre checked. That is the first option when you're going through an order. You, you, if there's an order that has, if I remember correct, because we don't use Cerner now, there are options when you have an order that's outside of the standard dosage range. And the first one says, discussed with provider. And that's what it defaults to and is pre-checked. Okay, so let me ask you this then. This, the testimony about um, the call for the allergies, did you put that in the comment section? I don't recall any testimony about allergies. I'm sorry, did you recall to the ER? No, I didn't document that. You didn't, in the in, you didn't put that in the comment section? No, I put that in the email I sent to Randy. Okay, the email you sent to Randy isn't a medical record. You would agree with that? Correct. And in your role as a pharmacist, you know the importance of the medical record, do you not? I do. go through a few things during your CPD interview. Would you agree with me that the interview you gave with the Columbus Police Department was your first interview or second? I believe it may have been the first. Okay, and that interview, if it was the first, does uh, December 10th of 2018 sound familiar to you as a date? Yes, that would be correct. During that interview, um, the detectives didn't have any patient medical records. Is that true? That is true. They were just questioning you about dosages and dates. Correct. And even for the best of us, it's hard to remember doses and the dates without complete medical records to review. Correct. You were asked, were you not, a lot of questions about Dr. Husel and his dosing habits. Do you remember generally being asked about those? Yes. And then you were asked about your thoughts on those dosing habits with respect to fentanyl. Do you remember being asked about that? Yes. And, um, and you talked about how there was no evidence that you knew of in your capacity as a pharmacist working at Mount Carmel that what he was doing was wrong. Objection, Your Honor. You're all asked for an ultimate conclusion. Okay. Let's take a little sidebar here, because I know we're going to need it here in a second. Talk amongst each other. I don't know what happened to Darcy.
Yeah, we do. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Rezor, just returning to that question I, I just asked you. Uh, during your CPD interview, you were asked a number of questions and, and what you, uh, as of December 10th, 2008, thought about uh, the dosing habits of Mr. Fusel. Remember that line of questioning? Vaguely, yes. And isn't it true that actually you indicated to the detectives that there's not a lot of evidence we have to say that what he's doing is wrong? I did make that statement. One moment. Dresbach. There should be any discussion later. That defendants exhibit eleven, page two seventy nine, that called for the fourteen thousand three hundred and twenty one plus micrograms of fentanyl is a mistake. I wanted to just show you what's marked as Defendant's Exhibit 11, page 83. What, what appears to be the patient name there? Uh, that is James Nick Timmons. And uh, same patient name as, as that last order that I showed you? Yes. Okay. And does it appear, just based on your uh, recollection of my prior questioning, that the uh, anesthesiologist indicated on this is the same doctor that was um, ordering of the 14,000? They appear the same, yes. And this number right here next to fentanyl on Defendant's Exhibit 11, page 83, uh, does it appear, and I'm certainly happy to cross-reference, does it appear to be the same or similar okay. number that's also on Let's the order sheet? Let's deal with the document sheet? you're dealing with, and then sure. the subject cross-referencing is more theirs. Sure. Uh, exhibit 11, page 83. Next to fentanyl, what's the number that's uh, indicated there? 14,321.2494 micrograms. And what are those medications that are also being ordered right along with that fentanyl? Uh, midazolam, propofol, phenylephrine, rocuronium, norepinephrine, and cefazolin. What's the order of propofol for? I mean, not four, but what is the amount? 30 milligrams. And the uh, uh, midazolam? Three milligrams. And just for cross-comparison now, showing you what's been marked as Exhibit 11, page 279. Does that appear to be the same physician? Yes. And the amount of the uh, micrograms of fentanyl being over 14,000, does that appear to be the same? It does. Nothing further. I won't be longer. Okay. Mr. Dressbach, I'm going to put back up what's been marked as Exhibit 11, page 83. This is, what's this at the top? What's this tell us it is? Uh, anesthesia record, date finalized, October 23rd, 2018, 39, page 104. And Jack Timmons again, or James Jack. Timmons. We keep saying Jack. So you got me here. James, James Nick Timmons. Timmons, yes. All right, what's going on here? What's this telling you is going on? 
This appears to be a record of medications administered during surgery. All right. And I see rocuronium again? Yes. A paralytic? A paralytic. So safe to assume he's ventilated at this point. Objection as to what All right. assumption okay. we made. Would I can re answer ask it, Your Honor. Well re ask, don't re answer. Re ask it. <laughs> Would you believe, or I'll let me rephrase that, what do you believe is going on here? It's anesthesia, and you indicated it's an anesthesia report. It looks like the patient is under general anesthesia for surgery, which would require intubation. Okay, and intubation means what to us? You're on a breathing machine to do your breathing for you, a ventilator. So is this type of dosage appropriate if the ventilator is breathing for them? Yeah. Okay. Sustained. Do you know whether this type of dosage is appropriate? Okay. Sustained. Okay. Same issue. We talked a little bit about Ryan Hayes. Are you aware of what his medical circumstances were when you were approving medication? No. All right, and you indicated there's not a lot of evidence to say what he's doing is wrong. What did, that's what you told Columbus PD. What did you mean by that? Giving these higher doses than I would typically expect to see in an instance of palliative vent withdrawal. All right, explain that to me, I think. There was a, there, with fentanyl in particular, having no dose ceiling, then it's hard to establish any evidence that giving doses like that during the power of event withdrawal or the removal of the breathing tube is wrong. And that's based upon what you know in your job as a pharmacist? Based on my experience, yes. And that's because, as you stated, there's no maximum dosage for fentanyl? Correct. And that's pursuant to Lexicon? Right, there's no therapeutic ceiling. What is, if Lexicomp does not have a maximum dosage on it, what then are you supposed to do to determine what an appropriate maximum dosage is? You, Your Honor, I would argue it's, a, um, it's, it's beyond his expertise. It's, he's not even tendered as an expert, but I don't think he's qualified to answer the question. Okay, so you're saying it's outside of the scope? Yes. Stain. Your Honor, I believe she Sustained. asked. Sustain. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. Are you familiar with a policy at Mount Carmel regarding what to do if there's no maximum dose listed anywhere? I am not. Okay, thank you. Ms. Manash, you brought out that you're not physically there, Mr. Dresscock, when you, you don't know what's going on in the rooms, correct? At the time you approved medications? Correct. Other people are, though? Yes, presumably. And I would assume that we were going to hear testimony. They can tell us that. Would you? I'll permit it, just since it appears. Would you agree with that? I have no idea who all you're going to hear testimony from, but I would assume yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. Okay. You can step down. Why don't you just hang there? I'm going to send the jury to lunch. So, Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, have a wonderful lunch. 1.30 promptly. Remember the admonitions? Have a great lunch, and I hope the microwave line's not too bad today. All right. Yeah, I'm just organizing these. I can't these seem to volunteers. find another one. <laughs> yeah, that's what we're looking at now. Okay, there we go. Okay, no. There's ours.
that those is. Do you want me to put these back in your book? Yeah, except I don't think I hold that. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to put on anything else for the record. Ms. Swanson? Sawyer, Judge. Sawyer, Sawyer I mean. not answering. Yes. No, there's nothing further, Your Honor, we need from this one. Ms. Menashe? Anything more for the record yes. before I close it? No, Your Honor, thank you. Okay. You can step on out. You're excused. Thank you. Thank you.